Hey Dietrich Labs, Sam here. So in this video I'm going to show you how to solve the Klein-Gordon equation for the one electron atom. Or, you know, the most famous one is the hydrogen atom, so I'm probably going to put solving the Klein-Gordon equation for the hydrogen atom in the title. Now the Klein-Gordon equation gives the wrong answer uh, for the actual electron because Ultimately, the Klein-Gordon equation describes a relativistic scalar, and fundamentally an electron is not a relativistic scalar. Uh, however, it's still a fun mathematical physics problem, and it shows you what a hydrogen atom would be like if it, an electron was a relativistic scalar instead of a, a spinner. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's worth doing. It's also just cool math. I mean, really, it's cool. Uh, <clears throat> also, if you ever were to find a, a negatively charged uh, a negatively charged scalar particle and you put it around a proton and you wondered what the energy levels would be, well, this uh, will answer that question. So the first step in solving the Klein-Gordon equation for the one electron atom is to write out the U1 gauge covariant Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, and that you just do with the standard electromagnetic gauge covariant derivative, which we've got here. And then this is the hydrogen atom problem, so we pick the Coulomb potential, stick that in, boom, we've got the Klein-Gordon equation for the hydrogen atom problem. So then I manipulated it a little bit to uh, get the form of the energy operator in there. And then, because we're studying energy eigenstates, that's why I bothered to get the energy operator in exact form in there. We can replace it with the eigenvalue because it's applied to the wave function. So, uh, we get this equation. Now, this is the equation we're actually going to solve. It's a spherically symmetric problem, so of course we're using the Laplace and its spherical coordinates. So then if we stick that in, we have this equation. This is the separable partial differential equation that we uh, need to attack. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now we separate variables. So the first step was to set it up for separating the radial part off of the angles. And I ultimately did that by uh, clustering these terms together, getting them all on the same side of the equation and uh, dividing uh, these constants so that they were stuck in these constant heavy terms and these uh, ones, these terms from the Laplacian were not um, multiplied by any of the constants in the problem. <clears throat> so then the next thing I did was I multiplied by r squared and subtracted these two terms to the other side leaving all the radially dependent ones on the left. That way, as soon as I picked the separation onsets and did the separation, just by, uh, I could then accomplish that just by dividing by the solution and I'd be done. <clears throat> okay, so I meant phi. I, it's a typo. I put psi there, but really I mean phi, like what's in the actual equation we're solving. <laughs> so just pretend that's phi. I've already changed it in the actual Word document, but I didn't want to reprint everything or reprint this page just for that one tiny little thing here. I'll write over it. I'll write a, f a f there we go, phi. Okay, so now that's clearer. <clears throat> so then uh, with this separation on thoughts, I plugged it in divided by the solution and because I had it written this way, that immediately gave me the separated equation. So I had all the r dependents on one side, all the angular dependents on the other, and I set it equal to the separation constant. It was required to get the angular equation to be solved by the standard spherical harmonics. Uh, so then, reading those two equations off, we get uh, <clears throat> first the angular equation, which as I said, oh wait, not on screen. Okay, the angular equation, which as I said, I picked this constant specifically so that this is the exact standard spherical harmonic equation. That way the whole angular part is just the standard normalized spherical harmonics, which in the quantum mechanics convention you have this epsilon thing here. <clears throat> uh, it's exactly what you're used to, like from the Schrodinger equation, the angular equation is the same, it's the standard spherical harmonics equation, and 
So the standard spherical harmonics uh, <clears throat> are this normalization constant times the associated Legendre polynomials of cosine theta times the azimuthal phase that we're all used to. And then uh, just in case you don't want to look them up or uh, didn't know, I've written out the definition of the associated Legendre polynomials in terms of the Legendre polynomials and the definition of the Legendre polynomials. And also uh, from studying the nature of the spherical harmonics, you get this restriction. Now I, in my video on the solving the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, link in the description, uh, I actually went into the detail of separating variables on this, solving for the azimuthal phase, getting the, uh, you know, imposing single-valuedness and boundary conditions and normalizability. Um, <clears throat> really, uh, the only boundary condition, well, I guess single-valuedness and normalizability, if I remember correctly, are kind of the, the, the key things here because this is the angular part. Normalizability gets a bit more complicated in the radial part. But anyway, I went through all the details on how you actually uh, break this equation apart into a polar equation and an azimuthal equation. And then I solved the uh, azimuthal equation, and then I talked about the polar equation, gave its solution, or the, the relevant subset of its solutions, and I talked about why they were the relevant subset, and... Uh, all that, and then I went through the normalization procedure, and uh, <clears throat> I talked about this constraint, how it comes out of the nature of the spherical harmonics. I did a whole bunch of detail on the spherical harmonics in that video, so I'm not going to redo it. I'm just going to reference you to my video on the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. So that means we're, uh, we ultimately only have the the radial part left to solve because this is the angular equation in its full solution the full normalized solution. So that that finishes that up quickly. So the radial equation is where things start to deviate from the Schrodinger equation. The fact that the radial equation is different is why the energy comes out different than the Schrodinger equation problem and why the wave functions turn out to be a little bit different than the Schrodinger equation problem. <clears throat> so uh, uh, it, 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 this is where it starts to get interesting. And because I already did the Schrodinger equation and this is where it first deviates, that's uh, the main reason why I didn't go into detail on the spherical harmonics. It's not where it gets interesting yet. And also I already did it. So uh, the solving process, although the equation is a little different, it's not different enough for the solving process to be much different. Still, we have this term from the Laplacian and spherical coordinates, and the way to simplify that is with the same substitution. So we factor out a 1 over r from the, 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 the radial factor. <clears throat> we stick it in, it simplifies down the second derivative in exactly the same way. We plug that in and multiply by r, and it gives us this equation. Now, um, just like in the Schrodinger equation problem, the goal here is to absorb some of the constants in a change of variables to rho, uh, by, and it's just a constant rescaling of the radial coordinate. However, in the Klein-Gordon problem, the constant by which we're rescaling it is different than the constant we picked in the Schrodinger equation problem for the hydrogen atom. <clears throat> Specifically, we're going to rescale it by a factor of beta, which is this. Uh, it's different than the constant by which we rescaled it in in the non-relativistic limit. Uh, okay, so then I also uh, not only define this in preparation for uh, um, <clears throat> changing variables to rho, but I also wanted to mess around with the constants up here. I messed around with those constants so that I can uh, define a convenient a constant that, that is both convenient uh, for the solving process and also condenses this a little bit. Basically what I, I did was I multiplied L through and then I added and subtracted a, a fourth and then I that was completing the square so then I completed the square here uh, and I'm going to define a constant called mu on the next page which is the square root of this and that ultimately is it simplifies the problem and is also convenient for solving. And then after that, I will proceed to actually do 
the change of variables that was made convenient by defining this beta. Okay, so... Uh, ah, next page. So then this is that mu constant that I was talking about. I'm just going to define it on the next page. So if we see this equation here, and then uh, we define that mu, it becomes this. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing I did was I divided by beta squared. And I specifically stuck one of the betas in this term in that factor and one on the r so that the change of variables is super obvious. Then I defined the variable rho and I stuck all this these bunch of constants into a lambda. Uh, and then that gave me this really nice simple equation. And I changed the name of the function because sometimes I like to do that when I change variables. Even if it's just something as simple as a constant uh, factor on, on the old variable equals the new one. <clears throat> so now this is the form of the radial equation that we're actually going to bang our heads against. This is the one we're actually going to solve. And the process we're going to use is just like the one we used for the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so uh, the process I used for the Schrodinger radial equation was to uh, first take the asymptotic limits of the equation, solve those, then uh, ignore the non-normalizable solutions to the asymptotic equations, and then uh, take the asymptotic behavior of the solution I'm interested in to be given by the, the terms in the solution that, that I didn't throw out. So that gave the asymptotic behavior. I then factored the asymptotic behavior out of this w function, so that amounted to picking the onsets of w equals the two asymptotic forms times some uh, function v with the asymptotic parts factored out. And since the asymptotic behavior is factored out, we expect it to be nicely described by a power series. So then I uh, pick a power series for the equation for v and solve away. So the first step then is to look at the asymptotic behavior of this equation as I described. In the large row limit, these two terms go to zero and we're left with this equation. The solutions are trivially easy to see as these two exponentials. Uh, this one's non-normalizable, so we're left with that one. So our desired asymptotic form is simply e to the minus rho over 2. So if we, t if we look back at this equation, we take the, uh, the small row limit instead of a large one. This is insignificant. It's a constant, of course. And these two grow, but this one grows way faster, so that one dominates, and our equation reduces to this. The solutions to this equation uh, are, are these two, but it turns out that one's non-normalizable, unfortunately. So then this is our uh, asymptotic form. So then our solution, based on factoring out the asymptotic behavior, our, our onsatz right, is right there, the two asymptotic forms times some v function, or function that I labeled v. Okay, so now let's plug that into the equation. Looking at the back, the most complicated part is taking the second derivative of w. If you do it and simplify it down, you get that. Substituting that into the equation gives us this mess. But ultimately, terms cancel and it simplifies down to a slightly less awful mess, defining a few new constants to absorb some of the ones that show up in that equation. And um, <clears throat> here we get this really nice simple equation. And this one we can attack with a power series. So we postulate that it's some power series, and then we... Uh, take derivatives of it, stick it in the equation. Now you can look at these derivatives and you can actually uh, not change the power series by incrementing up the value of j in the uh, in this thing in the sum. And the reason why is because the first few, or one in this case, and two in, in, in this case is actually zero because factors in the front of it go to zero, so then we're free to erase the value of the index by one in that case and two in this case. And we use that here to make the power on the row the same. So then we can factor it out and get this. However, uh, this implies that the coefficients are zero, of course, which gives us this recurrence relation ultimately. 
And now that if we take if we subtract one from j, then we get this version of the recurrence relation, which actually I see more often in the literature than uh, this version of the recurrence relation. I don't know why that is, but this seems to be the way it's more often written. Okay, so uh, now we need to explore the large j behavior of this, because ultimately we'll see that it's non-normalizable and that we have to terminate. That'll give us quantized energy and all that stuff. So if we look at uh, <clears throat> this version of the recursion relation and we eliminate all the things that are insignificant in the large j situation, it reduces down to just that, just a 1 over j which of course implies that cj equals 1 over j factorial c0. <clears throat> now if we insert that into the power series and sum to infinity, of course it gives us an exponential. And we can see that that gives us absolutely non-normalizable behavior, which tells us we have to terminate, and that gives us energy quantization. So we terminate at some power j max, so cj max plus 1 equals 0. But then looking back at the... Um, uh, this uh, recurrence relation here, if uh, cj plus 1 equals 0, then ultimately from the recurrence relation we get this result, that termination condition, if it terminates at j max, then this is 0, but that means this numerator is 0 here, and there's the equation we solve for the energy. Okay, so picking j max to be some non-negative integer k, so nothing less than zero because we can't terminate at a power less than zero. It didn't show up in our original power series. So then we plug in the value of, of b in terms of mu and lambda, and then we plug in mu and lambda, and we do some algebra, and ultimately, hey, we get an energy... Oh, it's not on screen. We get an energy formula. Now if we pick uh, the principal quantum number to be n, then because we already established k has a lowest value of 0, and actually it comes from, uh, it has to do with the spherical harmonics, but the lowest value of L is 0, then if we pick n equal to this, the principal quantum number equal to this in terms of L and uh, the power at which we're terminating, k, then we get the restriction that n or L equals n minus 1. So basically that's how we write the energy formulas in terms of the quantum numbers we're interested in dealing with, the familiar ones. <clears throat> so then that's the formula in terms of the familiar quantum numbers. This is kind of the, the big result. Now uh, we have a, the full radial wave function, which is a, a normalization constant times the 1 over R we factored out initially, times the two asymptotic forms there, times those polynomials V and L, which were given by the terminated power series corresponding to this recurrence relation. So they look like that. Right. Okay, so then where where you terminate it depends on N and L. Terminates at K, uh, and K equals that in terms of N and L. So it controls where you terminate it, the quantum numbers do, and, and tells you, therefore, what polynomial to be using. So then multiplying that by the angular part, and we have the full solution. And again, I meant to use phi for the wave function here, which I did in the beginning. And I also made a typo about it, as you saw in the beginning. So let's just rewrite that now as phi. Okay, so that is how you solve the Klein-Gordon equation for the one electron atom. It's a wicked cool mathematical physics problem. That's how you get the energy eigenvalues and the exact solutions. Dietrich out.